when, when is a real linear map from C to C is complex linear. When is a real differentiable function on a domain in the complex plane is complex differentiable. Right? A real differentiable function is complex differentiable if and only if it satisfies the Cauchy Riemann equations. Of course, again, equivalent to saying that uh, the real and imaginary parts have continuous first partial derivatives, again, satisfying the Cauchy Riemann equations. And then uh, an analytic function was defined as a function which is differentiable at every point of the domain that we are looking at. Right. The simplest examples of uh, analytic functions are the polynomials, which are analytic everywhere in the plane, so they are what are called entire functions. And then you have the rational functions, which are quotients of polynomials. Uh, these are not analytic everywhere because of the zeros of the denominator there, so except at the zeros of the denominator, uh, the irrational function is, is analytic everywhere in the plane. So it's, again, only a finite number of exceptional points, right? A, comp a polynomial has only finite number of roots. So a rational function is analytic in the whole plane minus a finite set. The most important examples of uh, Analytic functions are given by power series, right? So we take any power series, we saw that there are essentially three possibilities. It converges only at the center, right? If you are looking at a power series around point Z0, then it converges only at Z0. So this is the first possibility. This is a trivial case not interesting. And the second case is where there is a finite positive number r such that the power series converges everywhere inside the disk of radius r with center at z0. And moreover, the convergence is absolute and uniform on every closed disk inside that. Or if you like, you can also say inside any compact subset of that disk of radius r. Of course, the third possibility is that the radius of convergence is infinite, in which case the power series converges everywhere in the plane, and uh, that gives rise to an entire function. Of course, that comes later, because we proved after that. So the first result was any power series, there is an r such that the power series converges inside that uh, disk of radius r and does not converge outside that disk. On the boundary, anything can happen. So this circle is called the circle of convergence. The radius of the circle is the radius of convergence. And the most important thing is that inside the circle of convergence, the function represented by the power series is analytic, right? Differentiable at each point of the disk, and the derivative is given by the power series, a power series again, which is got by differentiating the original power series term by term. Each term you differentiate. If you have sigma a n z to the n, so the power series for a prime z is going to be sigma n a n z to the n minus 1. The differentiated series, we observe that uh, it also has the same radius of convergence as the original power series. So you can differentiate as many times as you want. And every time you get a power series, 
the same radius of convergence. So all those therefore represent analytic functions inside the circle of convergence. So all the derivatives also are analytic functions. Mm, yeah, that's all I think we did. Uh, of course, as, as examples, we have the most important function of all, namely the exponential function. And then the sine and cosine function defined in terms of the exponential function. So these are all entire functions which are not polynomial, so they are called transcendental entire functions. Okay? I think that's where we stop. So the, the task for today is to show that starting from our definition of analyticity, how to get a power series expansion for the function around each point in the domain. Right? Every analytic function has a local power series expansion. What do you mean by local? In a neighborhood of, of each point. Right? Of course, your domain can be anything, whereas your domain of convergence of any power series is, is a disk. Right? So you can't expect a power series expansion which holds the whole domain, right? So this expansion holds only locally around each point of the domain, right? So this was what we started with, right? In the beginning, we said uh, in the complex case, in contrast to the real case, once you assume a single differentiability, you get the strongest form of smoothness, namely not only infinite differentiability, but actually a power series expansion. See, yesterday we saw that anything which has a power series expansion is infinitely differentiable. So having a power series expansion is stronger than infinite differentiability in the real case, of course. In the complex case, everything is the same. Just once differentiability or infinite differentiability or positive expansion. So that's the magic of the complex plane. Okay, so, so, so now we would like to get that, what we were promising in the first lecture, that any analytic function has a local power series expansion. Okay, so towards that, so the, basically what we are uh, going to do is what is called Cauchy's theory. So everything depends on the concept of a function, uh, the integral of a function along a curve. Okay. So wh what is usually called as contour integrals or integrals over a path or whatever. Okay. So if you have a function which is defined in a domain and you have a curve lying in the domain, so we want to talk about the integral of that function along that curve. But what is a curve? It's a function. Uh, we will st at least stick to continuity. It's a continuous curve if you want. A continuous curve is a continuous map from a closed interval into your domain, whatever domain you are looking at. A continuous curve in omega is a continuous map from a closed interval into omega. Uh, but then for our purposes, continuous curves are not good enough. For one, we are interested in differentiability of functions. Another problem is the length of the curve, whatever it means, right? A continuous curve may have infinite length. Of course, when you think of a curve, you don't think of the function, but the image, right? Image uh, of the function in the domain. So you might have heard of uh, space filling curves, for example, or piano curves. So the, 
they are a kind of a pathological curse, but they are nevertheless continuous curse. They have infinite length. See, there, there is a continuous function from the unit interval 0, 1 on to, for example, the unit square. So it fills every point of the unit square. So the length is obviously going to be infinite in that case. So <coughs> we don't want to look at such curves for our purposes. So to start with, we will like curves which have finite length. These are what are called rectifiable curves. Actually, we are, we are not going to discuss this also, but at least you should. So continuous curves. Rectifiable curves. So what is a rectifiable curve? Essentially speaking, curves whose lengths are finite. But how do you define? Mathematically, have you heard of uh, functions of bounded variation? So uh, a rectifiable curve is, is a function of bounded variation. So what, what does it mean? See, geometrically, if you look at a curve, how do you get the length of the curve? You can approximate the curve by polygonal lines, right? Line segments, like that. So, like that, okay. So, so you, you add up the, the lengths of all these line segments. So, as you take finer and finer uh, polygonal arcs like that, you are going to approximate the length of the curve, right? So, basically, a function of bounded variation gives you that. Supremum over the lengths of all uh, uh, polygonal arcs with vertices on the curve is finite. Right? So that means uh, if alpha is a curve, you will take a partition. So this is the interval on which alpha is defined, the curve is defined. If sum over all points of subdivision here, so alpha tj minus alpha tj minus 1, look at the sum of the absolute. So this is just the length of the line segment. If this is alpha tj minus 1, this is alpha tj, this is nothing but the length of that line segment there. Okay. So what we are, what the sum represents is the sum of the lengths of all those line segments that you have drawn. The supremum over all this, but what, you take supremum over what? All possible partitions, all possible polygonal arcs like that, which uh, translates into all possible partitions of the intro. Okay, so this supremum is finite. So this is, the, the supremum is called the length of the curve, by definition. So this is the length of the curve. But we are going to be slightly more restrictive. We are not going to consider just rectifiable curves, but sli slightly more conditions, uh, smoother curves. So, for example, continuously differentiable curves. Alpha is differentiable and alpha prime is continuous. But uh, there is a problem, right? Uh, in the sense that when you say differentiable, so for example, these polygonal arcs are not differentiable. At each corner, there is a problem of differentiability, although continuity is there, but there is a problem of differentiability. So, 
the most suitable class of curves for our purposes, what are called piecewise continuously differentiable functions. Meaning, you have the interval, so there is a subdivision of the interval so that on each sub-interval the function is C1. At the end points, I mean the points of subdivision, you may not have differentiability, right? Just like these corners here. So, the most suitable class of curves for our purposes are continuously differentiable curves. So, that's what we will do. Okay? So, all the curves that we are going to look at will be assumed to be piecewise continuously differentiable. Although, of course, much of the theory can be developed for rectifiable curves, but uh, we need a slightly more complicated <laughs> proofs for various things. So, but uh, for uh, all our purposes, for purposes of complex analysis, this piecewise C1 will be good enough. So that's what we will stick to. Okay. So piecewise C1 comes. So, all our curves will be assumed to be piecewise C1. C1, of course, means continuously differentiable. So, so you, are the, you have a domain, you have a, a piecewise continuous, uh, piecewise C1 curve in the domain. You want to integrate functions along such curves. Okay, so of course the integral can be defined without much problem for say continuous functions for example. All our integrals that we are going to define are going to be Riemann integrable, Riemann integrals. So no problem about uh, integration. So essentially what we want to look at or what usually is written in this form f z d z over the curve c. So what is the meaning of this? How do you define this? Of course, c is assumed to be piecewise c1 for our purposes. So c is uh, uh, given by t going to something that t. So this is piecewise c1. So, of course, for this, it's enough if you assume f is continuity. f is continuous, right? You don't need analyticity or anything. Suppose f is uh, uh, continuous on C. So, C is a continuous curve in, in your domain omega, okay? Of course, right now the domain is not uh, relevant, right? You have some continuous, uh, I mean, some curve in the plane, f is defined on that curve and continuous on that curve. So, if uh, curve is given by the function z t, so we can talk of z prime t. So, if you like, what is going to be this? dz t is going to be z prime t dt, right? Z is z t, function of t. So, so the obvious way to define the function, the, the integral is to define it as integral from A to B, f of z t, z prime t, dt. But 
but again you see uh, uh, z prime is defined only on i mean on, uh, not on the whole interval but there are some points where it's not defined but that doesn't matter as far as the integral is concerned right even if your function has finite number of discontinuities is going to be riemann integrable or if you like so you can split the curve into parts on each of which you do see one right and then add up integral over the whole thing is by definition integral over this plus integral over this plus integral over that and so on, right so either way if you can you this integral so this is the riemann integral okay when you think of a curve geometrically the picture you need uh, what is called an orientation you are going this way or coming this way right so that has to be kept in mind especially for closed curves uh this way or that way but usually the anti clockwise orientation is taken to be a positive orientation the other one is the negative orientation it's not that uh, if you have a curve c so you can define a curve the opposite curve if c goes this way minus c will go this way but how do you define the function so reflect everything about the origin so minus c is going to be defined on minus b minus a into your sum domain by t going to minus Z T. No, sorry. Z of minus T. If T T belongs to A B, if and only if minus T belongs to the. Okay. So. So if T uh, if C starts at A, uh, not A, whatever uh, point alpha here, ends at B, beta. Minus C will start at beta and end at A. Uh, of course, the point Z of A is called the initial point. Z of B is called the terminal point or whatever. of c and then integral over minus c of f the desired is going to be minus f the desired that's from the definition of course if you half that the initial point is same as the final point then you get what is called a closed curve or the loop of course one uses the term loop uh, more when you discuss homotopy or something of that kind fundamental groups and so on. so it's a closed curve it's essentially the most important fact of the whole business of whole of complex analysis is that
if f is analytic and c is a closed curve and i mean this is not as simple as that but essentially uh, under suitable conditions on uh, the domain conditions on the curve and so on integral of an analytic function around a closed curve is zero this is the basic theorem is called cauchy's theorem but uh, just stated this way it's completely false okay <laughs> unless you impose suitable conditions on the on the curve or on the domain so on uh, right this cauchy's theorem with suitable conditions that is important right it's not a global statement without any qualification right you need uh, really strong conditions on the curve or on the domain so this is the most basic theorem so we will come to that later but let's now at least uh, evaluate some of the simpler integrals examples for integrating functions along contours okay suppose so mostly we will be dealing with only closed contours okay suppose c is closed so general is a kind of blanket assumption what about z dz so essentially you see uh, so what what is the proof for this or even <laughs> constant functions if you are integrating why do you get zero along closed curves of course okay of course if you look at the definition <laughs> in this case it is trivial z is a constant z prime is going to be zero so whole thing is going to be zero but so this is zero what about this so let let me ask a slightly more general question suppose your f is such that uh, there is a function g whose derivative is f there is a g such that g prime is f then what can you say about so this is going to be can you tell me at least guess what the answer is going to be just look at the riemann integral forget all this curves and everything right if you have a differentiable function f prime on an integral ab okay so what is a to b integral f prime dt f prime t dt huh 
f of b minus f of a. So, can you guess the answer in this case? f of the function evaluated at the end point of the curve in general, you do not have to take a closed per curve for that, f evaluated at the uh, end point minus f evaluated at the initial point, f of uh, zb minus f of za. If the curve is closed, it is going to be 0, right? But that, that needs a proof, whatever you said, huh? see whether you can prove that. So, this is going to be I do not know, we might have used some other instead of using z itself, we might have called it something gamma or something, ok, but does not matter. It is alpha and there is beta, let us say. So, so if c is closed, So, this is 0. So, if a function is the derivative of some other function, then integral along a closed curve is 0. Right? In this case, you say that f has a primitive, g is called a primitive of f. Primitive means a function whose derivative is the given function. So, a function which has a primitive, the integral is 0 along any closed curve. So, that is, that needs a proof, right? That is not an obvious thing from the definition, but it is not difficult either, okay? So, look at this case, for instance, now function z, it has a primitive, right, obviously, namely, what is the primitive for z? z square by 2, if you differentiate z square by 2, you are going to get z. So, this is going to be 0. So more generally, powers of n, which powers of uh, z will have this property? Let us, for simplicity, let us take a circle, right, around 0, say mod z r, center 0 and, so in other words, what I am asking is, which powers of z are, uh, have primitives, all powers, all positive powers, what about negative powers? 1 over z, for example, does it have a primitive? Uh, log z is a tricky thing, complex logarithms. So, a priori, uh, we will not talk about log z right now. But 1 over z square, for example, if you take, if you have, do you have something whose derivative is 1 over z square? And go back to your school. How do you integrate? <laughs> what do you get if you integrate 1 over x square? You are going to get something, right? A minus x cube by 3 or whatever, right? Z square is, I mean, 1 over z square is the derivative of something, right? So, all powers except minus 1, right? As long as n is not minus 1, what happens to this power minus 1? <laughs> that is an important case for us for various purposes. So, let us take for example, right, 
where C is the circle. Circle with center Z naught and radius R, let's say. So let us let us call it uh, C Z naught R. Okay. So what is this? You have to Z prime T D T. So Z prime now is R e power i t and then i z minus z naught is R e i t. Right? So what do you get? This 2 pi i is a very important <laughs> number <laughs> in complex analysis. It will appear everywhere, not only in complex analysis, even in Fourier analysis, it is going to be appear everywhere. So what is the picture now? Here, this is the... So this is Z0. This is your C, C R, whatever it is. C Z0 R. If you look at, if you take a sm smaller disk, of course R is arbitrary any for any R, independent of R this one is. But if you take uh, domain like this, you take two circles, the same center at Z0, the function 1 over Z minus Z0 is analytic in this. In this domain. All right, if you, call, if you take this as your omega, so except, in fact, it's analytic everywhere outside this. any disk around zero, right? Around Z naught. So this actually, therefore, is a closed contour in a domain where the function is analytic. Right? F is analytic in omega, C is a closed contour in omega, but still integral of F Z D Z is non zero. So you already see that this is not universally true, right? Without conditions on, on the domain or on the curve, or anything, right? So that has to come always with qualifications. So you have an analytic function, and the closed contour, the integral around that analytic and the closed contour is non-zero for this analytic function. So it's a very important thing to observe. Simple thing, but So remember this integral. This will be needed again and again in future. One of the chief objectives is to prove such a thing under suitable conditions. We will get, we will actually prove many results of that kind with various conditions, right? But we start with uh, a very simple situation where this holds, but the most general form of that Cauchy theorem will postpone it to a later part of uh, the course. We'll use a simple form of Cauchy theorem to, first of all, to obtain whatever we s said already, get a local power series expansion for analytic functions. 
So this is what is called you can call it a Scotty's theorem for a triangle. Or a rectangle you can take, doesn't matter. But a triangle in, in some ways is simpler. Uh, this is also referred to as uh, I mentioned Gusa yesterday, so he was the one who showed that uh, in the definition of analyticity, assuming the continuity of the derivative is not needed, is superfluous. So for that, uh, proof actually will use this. Uh, actually, Gusa's lemma was the original uh, Gusa lemma was for rectangles, but we will do it for triangles because we have some advantages when you look at triangles in contrast to rectangles. So, so what does this say? When you take your closed curve to be a triangle, the integral is zero for any analytic function. Basically, that's what it is. Suppose. Suppose F is analytic in omega, T is a triangle in omega such that so when you say a triangle, it's only the boundary now we are talking about. But we want the interior of the triangle also to be contained in omega, such that the triangular region bounded by, uh, we can give some name there, it will be useful, um, bounded by T is also contained in omega. In other words, the triangle and also the interior are subsets of omega, then actually probably it's uh, better stated starting with this and then saying that for every function which is analytic on omega. This is true for any function which is analytic in omega. Okay, okay, doesn't matter. But before we go into the proof of this, let us look at uh, uh, some things about integrals that we need. This will be needed repeatedly, so we need a bound for this integral. F is a continuous function. So C is a compact set, right? It's an image of an interval, closed interval. So absolute value of F has a maximum on the curve C. So this is bounded by maximum on C of mod F. So then we'll use this notation, convenient. Maximum of mod fz as z varies over c times the length of c. 
Oh, uh, probably I didn't mention the, I mentioned uh, rectifiable curves, curves of finite length and so on. Uh, but we are looking at C1, piecewise C1 curves. These have finite length, right? In fact, the length is given by It's finite. Any continuously differentiable function is a function of bounded variation. Basically, that's the with, with our assumptions on the curves, this length is finite. So, bound for the function on the curve times the length of the curve. That's the bound for the integral. Okay, so forget the domain, look at the triangle, this is your T. So the strategy is to subdivide the triangle into smaller triangles. So to be specific, let us take the midpoints of all the sides and form a triangle. Right? So joining the midpoints of the sides of T Uh, we get four, four triangles. Let's call them as TJ. Um, so just mod Z prime T, right? That will give you the length of the image curve there. Anyway, so. Uh, so you get four triangles now. So, right, you are going to integrate like this. You can also integrate along each smaller triangle, you are going to integrate like this and then you are going to integrate like that, like that. So when you add up, what will you get? For example, if you take this one of these things, so this is a side of two of the triangles. When you integrate along this triangle, it's going to be oriented this way. When you integrate along this triangle, this is going to be oriented the other way. Right? So integration along this plus integration along this will give you zero. One is negative of the other. So in other words, if you look at What are you going to get? So all these sides of the inner triangle will cancel out and you will end up with integral along this plus integral along this. This will give you the integral of the whole thing, so on. So you will just end up with integral over t, fz, dz. So the integral that we want to evaluate is this sum of these four integrals. We will take absolute value, this is going to be less than or equal to sum of the absolute values of this, right?
is what we are going to get. If you take, so what, what is the relation between this and each one of this? We want to compare of course in absolute values if each of there are four terms remember okay so if each of them is less than one fourth of this then the whole thing is going to be less than this you can't have strict inequality in all the terms so at least one of this will be will have to be Retina are equal to one fourth of this. So, for some, okay, one of these triangles. Okay? So, choose such a triangle and let's say call it, uh, call the such a Tj as T sub 1, let us say. What do you do now? Start with T1 and repeat the whole thing. Take this as T1, divide, you will have four triangles again. Integral over T1 will be equal to some of the integral over all this. And in the same way, you will get integral over T1 is greater than or equal to one fourth of integral of one of those smaller ones. So call that as T2, and so on. Right? Also, observe uh, something about the lengths of these triangles. Length of T and length of these smaller triangles. What is the relation? We have taken the midpoints, so each of them is half the length of the size of the bigger triangle. So length is half the original triangle. Note that length of T1 is half of length of T. So proceed. So start with T1. and repeat the argument. To get a triangle T2 with And of course, the length What about the triangular regions themselves? Of course, the one is each is contained in the previous one, okay? Note also that with obvious notation. the triangular region so in each case you have the triangular region if this is T1 you have this, this closed triangle there so they decrease right this is original triangle region right of course now 
this delta 1 will be the triangular region bounded by T1 and so on, the obvious notation. So, so what do you get? Therefore, you get a sequence of triangles this way. So, we get, so right now only so much, then we we'll get, we get a sequence. Tn of triangles such that uh, okay so delta n plus one contains delta n uh, length of Tn is half or Tn plus one is half the length of Tn and integral mod uh, fz dz is which are equal to one fourth 